Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Jennifer Egertson, and I work in the International Student Support Program here at Santa Barbara City College. A few months ago, my colleagues and I were invited to a training about Islamophobia. We're always looking for ways to learn and understand more about our students' experiences and finding ways in how various issues connect with the local student population and how they are relevant to the things that they're learning here on our campus. Forgive me, I might have to check my notes. I just wrote this out today and I don't want to leave anything out. Um, <clears throat> some of our students are from predominantly Muslim countries like Libya, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and many, many others. And some of our Muslim students are from places like Sweden, United, Na uh, United Kingdom, France, um, I'm sorry, uh, Russia, Kazakhstan, India, and Nigeria, and many, many others from around the world. We also know that we have many local students, faculty, staff, and friends who are Muslim. And one thing that I have learned is that you cannot always tell who's a Muslim or who is not by the way that they look, by where they're from, or the language that they speak. We wanted to learn from this very diverse group of people about their personal experiences and background and to start a conversation about the things that we can all do to make sure that our campus is a safe and open and welcoming place for everybody. And here we are tonight. Um, this event is co-sponsored by seven different departments on our campus, the International Student Support Program, um, Student Equity Committee, Wellness Connection, Faculty Resource Center, EOPS, Still I Rise, and the Student Equity Coalition, as well as many individuals and off-campus con contributions such as 2020 A Year Without War um, and Akeel Hill and many others who contributed photographs and insight and many other things to help make this event happen. Tonight, our wonderful moderator and panelists will be sharing their personal experiences um, and have a conversation about how Islamophobia impacts their lives as well as our community as a whole. Uh, if you have questions, there will be some index cards floating around. Feel free to jot down your questions. We'll be going up and down the aisles here and there to collect your questions. And near the end of this conversation, we'll have our panelists answer a few of your questions. And then hopefully for any questions that we don't get to, we'll find a format for later on to continue this conversation and get those quest questions answered. Um, and finally, we have um, had a wonderful meal. I hope everybody had a chance to taste some of the really delicious food that they have provided. <laughs> Thank you, Student Equity Committee. <laughs> Yay. And it takes a lot of courage to be up here and share about our personal lives um, at an event like this. So I hope you will give our, our panelists and our moderator, Roxanne Pate, a very warm welcome. Thank you. Good evening. So I'm going to make sure I, I tend to talk really loudly. So if I'm speaking loud, let me know. <laughs> Um, yeah, my name is Roxanne Pate, and I work in uh, student health and wellness. And my job there is as a program advisor. I coordinate a program called the Wellness Connection. And our goal in the Wellness Connection is twofold. One, to promote healthy living, um, positive lifestyle choices that will lead to more success in life and in school um, and sort of in general, right? So we educate about that. And then the other side of what we do is helping to build connection. We know that uh, students who are more connected, people who are more connected and feel like they have a sense of community 
community are more successful. And so that's sort of how I landed here tonight, I believe, um, was because of that connection piece. Um, a little bit about me is my background is in clinical psychology. And so as we have this conversation tonight, it's not a psychological conversation at all, but um, I'm someone who likes to connect and know people a little bit more. We will have probably some things that lead us to discussion of politics and culture and religion as we talk about Islamophobia, but my goal really is just to talk about the human side of um, who the people on our panel are and, um, and then thinking out to the larger community as well. So I just wanted to preempt that a bit. Um, so now I wanted to just have an opportunity for our panelists to share a little bit about who they are, do a little introduction. And so I'm going to ask you maybe to take them, whoever wants to start, we can do it that way. And there's a microphone on each couch here. There's one right here. And you just have to push the bottom to get it started. And so I would love for you to introduce maybe your name, um, a little bit about yourself, maybe how you came to be in Santa Barbara, either as a city college student or staff or however you're here, and um, just a little bit about who you are. Okay. Hi, uh, my name is Raybal Al Shalati. Uh, I was born in Syria and raised in Kuwait. 21 years old, studying kinesiology and exercise science at City College. Um, I was studying uh, English as second language in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. That's where I was first uh, accepted. And then I decided to move to California uh, because I was not adapting very well in that environment. And I felt like I need, uh, I need to move on in my life and make a change. And I got accepted here and it was kind of long and hard process, but I feel uh, was I mean I feel it's it's worth it and I'm glad I'm here I'm grateful. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Rival. Hi everyone. My name is Hiba. I am a fourth year literature student at UCSB from LA. Um, I immigrated from India, and I came to UCSB to study literature and look at the various ways technology and literature interconnect and play together. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to speaking with you all. Hi, assalamu alaikum. My name is Saraceli Villanueva. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, I was born and raised in Mexico. I came to the United States when I was 13, and then I chose to come to UCSB after applying to different UCs. I thought UCSB was like the most beautiful school here, so I decided to come to UCSB. Second to SBCC, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course. <laughs> Actually, SBCC has like a really pretty <laughs> campus, so it might be the first one. <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Ida. Um, I am a student at UCLA, and it's going to be done next quarter. I'm so excited. Um, <laughs> I moved to Santa Barbara uh, about 15 years ago. I'm married to Yama. We have three kids. And i um, excited to be here with you guys and come back to campus. I'm a SBCC alum, and I love this campus. No comparison. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Yama Niazi. I am the imam, uh, the imam of the Islamic Society of Santa Barbara. And I grew up here mostly in Santa Barbara pretty much most of my life. Uh, very excited to be here. I want to thank the organizers and those that put this together. I think it's coming around, along to a very nice program and looking to share with you all um, a little bit about our lives and a little bit about our religion. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Akil Hill. I'm pretty much from Santa Barbara. Uh, my f mother and father were uh, in the military, so I was actually born overseas. Um, Spent some time uh, back east, the Midwest, but I graduated from Santa Barbara High School. Uh, I currently work here, so there's a lot of uh, familiar faces. Um, if I denied your petition, I apologize. <laughs> it's a, it was a policy of the college, not my own doing. Um, I went to, uh, to Santa Barbara High School. Um, I've been knowing Yama for a while, one of my dearest friends. I was actually at their wedding in Canada, so um, looking forward to uh, just having a good open dialogue. Um, and I want to thank all the people who've committed uh, to making uh, this event uh, um, 
actually possible. And uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so my next question is, I'm so very excited and extremely nervous to be here um, in this spot right here. Um, but I wonder what prompted some of you when you heard about what we were doing tonight, um, having a panel talking about Islamophobia, um, what made you think, I want to do that? I'll, I'll participate. So anyone who wants to answer is welcome. <laughs> and as I did in classes, if you don't start answering, I will start calling on people. <laughs> Um, I wanted to participate, uh, I wanted to share my voice and share some, some of my experience. Um, I feel it's important to be involved and learn more about my religion, and sp especially in different language, you know, in Arabic. Um, I feel also that if I get involved, I can show some support and love to my religion and I can feel satisfied and uh, pretty much just feel good and yeah. Great. Well, uh, I wanted to be in this panel to like show diversity among the Muslim community <laughs> and also um, to like represent the women who wear the hijab who are more exposed to Islamophobia so we wanted to talk about that. Wonderful, thank you. How about couch number two? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you, those that don't know me, you'll hear a lot from me later, so um, I want to... My next question uh, is for you. <laughs> so why don't I pass this to Akil? <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, in my experience, um, I think that there's been a heightened sense uh, with this new administration. Um, and so I think a lot of people are on edge. Um, and so I, I feel that it's important um, to, to come here to show that, um, one, I converted to Islam, so it was a conscious choice. Um, but to show that, you know, Muslims are diverse um, and um, our perspectives on things are different too as well. But um, I feel like it's almost, for me, it was almost like an obligation that I actually speak out uh, just because um, the images that sometimes are portrayed of, of this religion um, is um, a bit extreme. Um, and so I, I had a responsibility. I had a responsibility to this campus because I'm an employee of the college to be able to speak out and show, hey, look, there's Muslims on campus. Um, and so that's, that's why I chose to actually be a part of, of the panel. Thank you so much. And you all touched on topics that we'll hopefully have a chance to explore a little bit more. Um, so my next question was for you, Imam Yama. Um, I wanted to see if we can start with a little bit of definitions, maybe for the audience who doesn't, doesn't have some of this information. Um, so can you just do a little quick uh, breakdown of the difference between Islam and Muslim? Sure. Um, Islam is the religion that is practiced, of course, by over a billion people uh, worldwide. And a Muslim is the one who practices the religion. And very interestingly enough, to kind of demonstrate how new Islam is still in this country, um, and a lot of people that are not familiar with it, I still get people that come up to me and say, are you Islam? And I say, no, I'm not Islam. I'm a Muslim that practices Islam. And um, so I would say that one thing that I think people might hear about tonight is the difference between Islam, or as one of my dear friends who's a doctor who started this movement throughout the United States to inform people about what true Islam is, he calls it Mislam. So there's Islam and then there's Mislam. And much of what people hate what they're seeing in the news and certain images or reputation of certain groups of Muslims is what I call Mislam. And what they'll find out tonight is I think we'll have a lot in common in the sense that we also reject Mislam, right. terrorism, extremism, ISIS, and those kind of things like that. And you get down to just being a human being, being a Muslim in the city, particularly Santa Barbara, and having a lot of similar struggles and difficulties that everybody else has. So. I would say that, you know, and then Islam has five pillars of faith, 
And I think that's the core of what makes somebody a Muslim is it's, it's a daily dedication to prayer, to fasting one month out of the 12 months and trying to go for a pilgrimage once in a lifetime and giving a certain amount of your wealth to the poor once a year. So it's about prayer, charity, pilgrimage, fasting. This is the pillars of practice in Islam. So, and you know, a lot more. So it sounds like the pillars are what Islam is. Islam is that propaganda, right. the stereotypes, the things, the negative things we see in the media, which unfortunately are all too often, right? right. Okay. So then, um, kind of taking that to the next place, I, I wondered if you can discuss a little bit the distinction between culture and religion, right? So we have Islam as the religion, but then there's also Islam in culture, right? right. And I think that distinction is important. Well, my culture, for example, uh, myself and my wife, we are from Afghanistan. There's, um, I left Afghanistan when I was about five years old. My wife left, I think she was three. So we grew up in different cultures. She's from Canada, grew up there, and I grew up here in America. So um, well, one thing you'll see is that Islam as a religion gives you certain standards and certain teachings, but then... It's left to the culture to practice it how it really wants and what you see as the way to practice your religion. So the way Islam is practiced in some of its ways in Africa is different than how it is practiced in the Middle East as opposed to Asia and other places. Um, the topic would be very vast and maybe not enough time, but I would say one thing I want to add about that is a lot of the problems we see in the media uh, with certain practices Muslims are doing are a cultural problem, not a religious problem. So, for example, when you see women being denied education, that's in Afghanistan under Taliban rule. It's not in Malaysia. It's not in other countries. That's a cultural practice, a mispractice of the beautiful religion. Um, and when we see um, other types of things we read in the media, um, you know, uh, female uh, mutilation, genital mutilation, you see that concentrated in certain areas and not in other areas. Uh, you'll see a lot of these things that are problematic and it's because it's that particular culture. If it was the religious problem, you would have seen it everywhere. So, um, and I think for me, I grew up here in America most of my life. Um, I try to see how the religion plays a role in us living here, what are the things that matter most of, what are the struggles, what are the ways of life that we can take as being in Santa Barbara in particular, that may vary, and I think in this room there's a lot of Muslims from all over the world. Yeah, so. A lot of variation. A lot of variation. Yeah. And I think that's something that we accept traditionally in American society, that other religions can have a, a, a wide variety, right, of how they practice and who they are. But for some reason with Islam, we've decided there's only one way to be, is to be Muslim, right? So that's something I think that we need to, to challenge a bit, a lot. Um, so talking about um, that, I think the reason we're here tonight, right, is to talk about Islamophobia. And so I was looking for definitions and finding a lot of um, different definitions for Islamophobia. And then I kind of went back to my roots a little bit and said, wait, let's deconstruct this word a little bit. And let's look at what a phobia is. Right? A phobia is sort of an extreme aversion or fear to something. And it's an irrational aversion. Uh, people who have phobias generally know this doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I just know I'm really afraid of it. Right? And um, so I, I took that part. And then we say, so of course, Islamophobia then is that extreme aversion or fear of Islam. But the unique thing about Islamophobia is that we take it again to that next level where it's not just about um, fear and aversion, but it becomes hostility and aggression and anger and propaganda, right? So it's, it's kind of a phobia at its next level. And so um, what I was wondering is when you all hear the word Islamophobia, what are those first thoughts and feelings that come to you? What, what gets triggered um, right off the bat? So what I usually think is um, typically like of me news castings and news um, talks about Islam about Islam um, that are usually present. Well, they're talking about Islam, but they don't have any Muslims there. Mm -hmm. So I usually think about how there's, it's misrepresented and how subtle it becomes 
within people like talking about Islam, they don't realize that they think that it's a hostile religion and there's so much violence in it that they're getting their information solely from people who don't who aren't Muslim right. in the media. So that's what I think of. Wow, that's really powerful. So really the first thing for you is that when we're having these conversations without anyone of the faith rep having a chance to represent or, or speak to it. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? First thought or feeling that comes up when you hear that word Islamophobia? Uh, first thoughts for a regular person would be fear, um, the limitation, uh, you know, I've, I've personally haven't experienced or faced any immediate hate or face me as a Muslim, but I feel it in between people. Mm -hmm. I feel like people thinking that Islam is ISIS, Islam is killing people, Islam is that extreme religion that if you don't pray, you will be punished. Or if you don't fast, you will go to where? You will not go to heaven. Right. It's just misconception and having the wrong image. Um, I mean, I hope, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really hard to share the right image of Islam and how we practice it, how we, we practice it back home or Middle East, generally speaking. Um, but I hope that we can, uh, Yama specifically can share uh, or uh, yeah, can share the right image of Islam and how people practice it and well, Islam means like peaceful, mer merciful, sharing love with people, not killing, not sharing intimidation, fear, yeah. So, Rabal, what I'm hearing is that for you, when you hear Islamophobia, it's sort of a frustration or a confusion that people don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And I do not blame them. Like, it's, it's completely regular. I mean, you're in the U.S., you're in a completely different region. It's completely normal that you would think of this just based on the social media and what's been uh, processed in the social media. Like, look at this YouTube and the, in the, look at these videos in the YouTube and see the ISIS and how people are killing each other. And they're all Muslims. Like the other person would think, okay, all I'm seeing is blood. All I'm seeing is people are being killed, and specifically in Syria, where, where I'm from. And it's, it's completely heartbreaking, like seeing my like, people from where I'm from are being killed, and they're all Muslims, right. you know? And there's another part like, called ISIS, that they're getting paid. They, they want to share the wrong image of Islam and completely, like, it's just, yeah. They're sharing Islam, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, that's so how about, how about um, some of others of you, when you hear that word Islamophobia, what are some thoughts and feelings that come up? Um, I think about the um, protesters who stand outside of mosques and instigate arguments with Muslims who are passing by with their children. Um, you know, waving their guns around. Just it's it's an instigation, right? They're calling out names uh, to people with their families, Muslims with their families, walking to go, go to the mosque and calling them names and and cursing at the prophet. Or you know, it's based all again in that misconception of what religion is, what Islam really is. So it's you know the same people that you would ask you would go to them and say well have you read the Quran and do you know what it is and they'll pull out verses that are violent or like you know yeah Islam says to kill the infidel or you know I mean right. they they pull out these verses out of context and we all know that we can do that with any book you know any religious book you can do that with you know without the commentary without knowing the history of of these verses you cannot interpret them in the way that you think or you you know I mean they're taking them and they're interpreting them based on how they feel about religion how they feel about Islam and what they think Muslims really do yeah. you know what we really do is we we raise our families just like everybody else we make dinner together we bake cookies with our kids um, you know we have our issues as well it's not always gonna be fun and games for us either you know we have real family issues we have troubles with our children I have a 11 year old who's getting into her teen years right. you know I mean, <laughs> oh fun you know and you know our we have our our plates full you know and right. so when we're getting yelled at you know oh you muslim you're this or that it's like you know 
There's a lot going on in my life that's probably the similar as what you're going through. So right. we have a lot in common that, that needs to be put out there and, you know, kind of to dispel those misconceptions. And right. And I'm going to assume that um, being Muslim is one part of who you are, right? But you're exactly. also a mother yeah, and a wife course. and a student and all of these other things, just like everyone else, right? Exactly. That we have so many hats we wear and, and parts of ourselves. Yeah. Um, did anyone else have an answer to the Islamophobia question? <laughs> Akil. <laughs> um, for me, um, when I hear the word um, Islamophobia, I, I just think it's a lack of understanding, It's right? Because Muslims have always been in America, right? This is nothing new. I mean, the majority of the slaves that were brought to this country were, was it, I believe, like uh, the statistics were one out of every four or one out of every three were, were Muslim. And um, so it's, again, a lack of, of understanding that Muslims have always been here from the beginning, and we've even helped build this country. Um, um, so, it, again, it's one of those things where... Um, I feel people just need to interact more um, in regards to, to dealing with Islamophobia. Muslims need to make themselves a little bit more uh, available to non-Muslims so we can all really understand and have a dialogue about, like, you know, just being human, which what uh, Ida was saying was our similarities are far greater than our differences. I think uh, one thing I think about with Islamophobia is it's uh, kind of touched upon by Ribal a little bit about, you know, we are new uh, in the sense that although, as Akil's mentioning, Muslims have always been here, but in a way we're more in the spotlight now and uh, people are really starting to discover Muslims now more. And I think there's something natural about it that you tend to fear what you don't understand, right. but at the same time, uh, 20, 30 years ago, there were not mosques, there weren't Muslims very visible. When I was young, the exciting thing was that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was a Muslim. Right. I played a lot of basketball, and I was just telling my daughter today that the leading scorer in NBA history is a Muslim, though my favorite player is Michael Jordan. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Kareem has the spotlight, right. and um, we are still new, and I think what you'll see is, yes, there are forces out there, exploiting it, causing people to fear Muslims and Islam. But I think as time goes on, people will see that those are a bunch of lies. Right. And like most communities, ethnic communities in this country, they went through a lot before they were fully accepted. And I feel like this is our time where we're going to go through this. And hopefully if we as Muslims stay strong, um, have perseverance and be patient, and also not be intimidated, but to stand up and share our religion with others saying, hey, please, you don't have to become Muslim, but at least you should know if you're not going to like us, don't like us for the right reasons, not for the wrong reasons. We're not here to hurt you. We're not here to harm you. We also have love thy neighbor, right? We also have love for others what you love for yourself. And that's all we want to share with you. And, you know, if Muslims were so violent and so crazy, 1.3 billion plus Muslims you'd see a lot more trouble than there is, but actually the percentage of uh, extremists are 0.0001%. Right. And we are acting like that's happening 99.99% of the time. And it's simply not true. And I think if we want to make America a better place, we have to focus on issues that really count. Thank you. So I, I want to come back to the conversation about Islamophobia um, and your own experiences, but I think it's important to kind of follow up on what Ida was saying about your, your everyday life and who you are. I think maybe we can, we can segue there for just a moment and talk about like what are the different parts of yourself in addition to being a Muslim? Um, or that are maybe the being Muslim is the foundation of all of these other parts of your life. So can you just share a little bit about those other things about you that, that are important or meaningful? Well, uh, there is, I feel that there is nothing, there is not that much big difference. I mean, for me personally, I, I go to school, okay, attend all my classes, go to the library, study for a few hours, go back, go to the gym, cook some meals, and I make sure that I pray uh, five times a day. I do not fast unless it was uh, Ramadan. And 
I uh, read the Holy Quran and so I can have some beliefs and uh, to try to apply uh, the words of God in my daily life activities and I can see results. I can, I can see that my life, the process of my life is easier. I attend classes, earning good grades, having good relationship with people. I, and at the same time, I make a balance. I also enjoy my life. Like, you know, I hang out with friends. We go and party, we, you know, we hang out, we do everything. But as long as you make a balance and you believe that there is one God. And, yeah. And, I mean, for me, I feel great, personally. And, uh, yeah. It sounds really familiar, right? I mean, how many people in here can say that sounds kind of familiar? I go to class, I study, I learn, or I go to work, I come home. I make food, I hang out with my friends, I maybe have some spirituality in my life. I mean, how many people? Right? It's really familiar. And again, when you, when you feel stressed out, okay, that's, I mean, that's, uh, everyone gets this feeling. I mean, for personally, I go back to myself. Some of you do some yoga or meditation. I go and, like, read some Holy Quran and do some askar. Uh, that's, that's called, like, God is the only one. I believe in you. Uh, I hope that you can help me uh, go through my problem and solve it. And I mean, I, sometimes I do not s notice or see any results, but I feel good, like internally, like from inside. And that's I, I think that's all matter. I mean, the results will come eventually. Right. And yeah. Thank you. How about how about others of you? I think it, I love that it sounds so familiar, right? It's really like our everyone's lives. Um, okay, uh, for me, like I said, I'm Mexican. I'm a convert to Islam. I converted when I was 15. Um, I go to school, just like almost everyone here. Mm -hmm. I volunteer at a middle school in Goleta. Um I hang out with my friends. I go to the library to study and do homework. I procrastinate, just like <laughs> every other student. <laughs> <laughs> I cook. Like, we live a pretty normal life. Right. Yeah. So what would you think are the things that maybe other people have a misconception about? How they might think that you're different? I think they think that just because I wear the hijab, I spend all my day praying yeah. or like in my house, not going out or just like staying in, inside the house. I'm like, no, like I have to go out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I have some people asking me those questions. Yeah. yeah. Uh, for me, I I have three kids, so that's pretty much keeps me and Yama pretty busy throughout the day. Uh, if it's not tending to them, it's uh, doing papers. I have four papers due by Monday. <laughs> four papers due by Monday and three yeah. kids. That sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. <laughs> so yeah. So I mean, you know, Yama and I will take turns cooking and hanging out with the kids and kind of. He does a lot. Of, he's like the primary parent, but, <laughs> you know, he helps a lot. And without him, I mean, we just, you know, we have a wonderful life at home with our kids, and it's as normal as we think it is, you know. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people think I'm oppressed or I, do, I have to do things against my will because I wear a hijab. Well, actually, I'm here tonight to force my own. <laughs> 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 so it's kind of true. <laughs> the, reluc the reluctant panelist. <laughs> So other than that, we, we do rallies together. We, you know, work on our foundation together. Um, you know, probably we, have, probably we have a lot more fun than some of the people we know out there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's really interesting, too, that you, you know, so like, again, like many of us, where you say we take turns making meals. And I think if many of us here tonight are honest with ourselves, that might have been a little bit of a surprise. Right? Like, oh, you take turns making, I mean, my husband doesn't even make dinner. So <laughs> I need him to talk to you <laughs> so we can figure that out. Um, but I think that's something that, again, one of those misconceptions, right? That one of those things that people automatically will jump in and assume that that wouldn't happen in your household. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I'll, I'll share a quick story. Um, today I called uh, Yama from work, and I'm like, you know, my, I was like, I said, like, so like him. He was like, like, so I'm like, what are you doing, bro? He's like, I'm doing dishes. 
So I said, mashallah, that's like, you know, much, you know, like, you know, I was like, you, you're doing it all, you know? I'm like, you're a, you're a 20th century guy. So I meant, <laughs> I meant, for me, um, I mean, my daily life is, is, you know, just like everyone else, you know, I think, um, I think the point of it in all this for Muslims is, you know, there's times where, you know, we, we're all tested, right? We all have ups and downs. And, um, and for me personally, I feel like, you know, there's times where I get things right and I get things wrong, you know, and, and but ultimately your faith should be what holds you down, you know, and, and, and I think that's the common thread uh, I feel that uh, is up here is that, look, you know, we have ups, we have downs, we're not different from anyone else, despite what the media says, and um, there's times we, where, we, where we feel super spiritual, and there's times where we, we maybe not feel as spiritual, but we're, we're definitely committed to what our religion says. Any other thoughts on daily life? The l day in the life of uh, Imam Yama? <laughs> <laughs> Other than doing dishes and making dinner? <laughs> we did uh, Taco Tuesdays last oh. night. Again, I'm going to hook you up uh, with my husband. Yes. <laughs> and apart from this program tonight, I'm speaking at San Luis Obispo tomorrow morning wow. about empathy and Islam. Um, my life has actually changed quite a bit after becoming the Imam and more so now. There's a lot of more traveling, a lot of spirituality involved in the sense that I feel the responsibility more now. It's a very heavy weight on the shoulders of someone who's trying to guide their community, guide their family, help with the children, and just trying to survive Santa Barbara life. It wasn't as I was growing up with Akil. Uh, I've known him since junior high. Um, before I got into Islam, I used to hip hop dance and rap and we do those things together, play basketball together. The idea of going to the gym, eating, and uh, that's, Ribal's life was something of the past for me. Um, <laughs> but my daily life is, you can say very difficult because the life of an imam now, you're constantly dealing with so many problems. I go to schools, I go to churches, I go to religious places. I go anywhere and everywhere that I can to share. <laughs> The Islam that you're seeing is not true Islam, that this is a beautiful religion and it has a lot of similarities to other beautiful religions of the, out there. So it's, um, I don't know, to be honest, like the last time I really felt just relaxed and to myself is when we're on vacation in Canada. And that's looking really like very appealing right now because <laughs> it's, uh, I, need a, I need a vacation. But <laughs> at the same time, until things become better in this country and then things until people really see Islam and Muslims for what they truly are it's a lifelong struggle for us and I think I'll be at the I'll be at that for a while yeah. <laughs> thank you Hiba did you have anything you wanted to add about your life um, I think RSLE summarized it pretty well okay. procrastinating <laughs> but since I'm a senior I'm like counting down the days until graduation that's the only difference Okay, <laughs> so counting down the days. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I'm going to go back to that question about Islamophobia again, and I think um, thinking of you, um, Yama, and your travel, um, <laughs> that's something that, that I think about a lot right now, and I'm sure many of us are thinking about as well. So you travel a lot. I've, you know, I looked at your webpage. Uh, you're all over the place. And so maybe we can start there with um, that question about Islamophobia and how have you experienced this directly in your life right now and and we can kind of look at it in three levels right internationally uh, maybe within our community here in Santa Barbara and then on our respective campuses of um, SBCC or UCSB so how have you uh, experienced Islamophobia in your lives well for me I mean um, there's some things that are happening that has happened that really brought things home I mean the shooting in Montreal um, six people died, uh, I think is the figure. And one of the gentlemen who was killed, he looked really familiar when I looked at his face and I realized that I had met that gentleman here in Santa Barbara. And uh, what I recall is he was one of the most gentlest, nicest people I've ever met in my life. I was very sad and I couldn't believe that 
even in Canada, somebody walks into a mosque, shoots them, and just kills them for just being another religion. If they knew what that person was like, you know, his personality, he had a wonderful little child that he had with him, it really breaks your heart. And for me, I am very sad when I see anyone hurt, uh, anyone that is killed, senseless killing, people that died for no reason, including here in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, I've done a vigil on gun violence, and actually, I didn't realize till I was at that church, I looked at the names, and I realized one of the girls I went to school with, and I remember her. And while I was up there, I said, that is so sad. So you're going to have to deal with this. This is part of the world we live in, unfortunately. There's violence. There's people that will kill you. I'll be quite honest with you. There, every Friday when I go to give my lecture, I always spiritually prepare in case somebody walks in and just does something really stupid and senseless. It's happening throughout this country right now. Um, and not only that, but now other communities are being attacked thanks to what's happening in the country. And the president has yet to address and say something uh, of you know, uh, words of sympathy, words that kind of you know, uh, console the families of those uh, people that were killed. Um, and so it's really crazy what's happening right now. People are being attacked, people are being killed, and this just shouldn't happen in our time. It shouldn't happen with all the hard work that we put in. All this progressiveness, we thought we put the 60s behind us, we put the 70s, we've, we're now at a different level. We're seeing we're going back. Right. And this is really, really sad. So um, it's, you know, and everywhere I go, uh, there's always somebody who has a lot of words they like to tell me. You know, that's uh, the rally. You know, I was speaking up on the rally uh, with Senator Hannah Beth Jackson, Congressman Salud Carbajal, and I was, as I was speaking, I was looking around, and you see all these faces of wonderful support. There's a guy in the very back, he's looking at me like this, and he does this, and I mm -hmm. said, and I just block him out. I'm just like, all right, one, several hundred, everything's going good. There's got to be that guy. There's always that guy, but it's okay. Perhaps he doesn't know a Muslim. Last time I did, we did the rally, there was a guy right on stage. He kind of caught me off uh, off guard and surprised a little because I turned around. He's right there. He said, you know, you Muslims are violent. You're this, this, and that. I said, you know, these things you're hearing, what you're reading is wrong. Why would I be up here? And why would I say what I'm saying if that was true? And he's like, well, maybe you are, but they're not. And I agree with that. I agree with that. Maybe there are crazies, and there are. Right. But you cannot blame what others do upon a, uh, upon a group of people that have nothing to do with that. Right. And... I'm also at the point where I don't have to apologize because my religion doesn't teach that. Uh, one, the 99.99% of Muslims are peaceful. They have nothing to do to harm others. Why do we have to take responsibility to speak up for uh, people that, that's another good topic and discussion would be, how did ISIS get there? Right. How, what is our role in kind of aiding that and assisting that? Even President Trump had some I don't know how to word this, but he acknowledged that before, that that's the mess we created. Right. So I think these are the types of things that we need to look at, and we got to say to ourselves, you know, we all have to do our part in trying to educate one another, and I think we live in a society now where so many people are coming up and supporting us. Every Friday prayer, there's somebody there that is coming to support us um, and showing support. Judy's right there, Marhala's right there. These guys are at everything. And there are Jewish friends from the community. And the, this support that we're seeing, this love we're seeing from all these different communities, we're going to get through this. And I think um, it's just a lot of work ahead, but we got to be patient. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of work and then a lot of emotional toll, right? To have to think every Friday when you're going to pray that you have to prepare yourself in some way. And I think as an individual, that's such an um, important a thing to think about, right? How it impacts you individually. But then in your case as um, the imam and, and having this congregation of people to think about, but then also as a father and a husband, right? So it, there's so many layers to the impact of these things. Yeah. 
How about others of you on the panel, your experiences of Islamophobia, things you might have found? And I, I think at this point, too, I want to acknowledge that we have a really diverse panel, which is exciting. And each person here has sort of a, a different experience. Um, the women who wear hijab, convert, you know, um, somebody who's from an international student here. And so you might have unique experiences if you can share some of those as well. Uh, so again, I was not born and raised here. Uh, so you're talking about the Im immediate and direct uh, Islamophobia issue that I've faced. That you, yeah, that you've experienced. Okay, so I do not. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not into polit uh, politics and the aspects of politics, but the the immediate uh, the, the immediate hate that I've received personally was from the president of the United States uh, about. Muslims that are being banned from certain countries, and I'm one of them. Right. I'm affected on this ban, and I can't go back to either Kuwait or Syria. Uh, so you can't go back to Kuwait or Syria. Yeah. So first of all, I should be grateful. Me being here, I should think of. The second thing, I can't see my family anymore. I can't see my brothers, parents, relatives back in Syria. Like I do have relatives from all over the world. I can't. I can't do that. Um, it just it just feels like bad, but I I do have a like strong belief in God that things are going to improve because because what I've noticed uh, in February there was an event that was held in State Street downtown. Um, it was hosted by the Tree, the Blessed Tree Foundation. We stand with immigrants, no wall, no ban, and they showed great support. And I was there, and I felt great. I felt okay. There's people right there, like in the community, they're helping us. I, I didn't feel lonely, you know. I, I felt like people they were waving papers, like we're we're with Muslims, and they they drew like really beautiful pictures about Islam, and they they're, they're Americans, like you know. So I I felt I felt great, like you know, seeing great support and that w they stand with us so i i believe this is this this is the immediate and direct issue that i'm facing right now mm -hmm. but again overall every muslim student here in the united states is trying to achieve one goal he or she wants to continue her education here seek for a better life okay why why did we leave the middle east or why did we leave our countries we, we know that, we have in mind that the education in the United States is very strong, living is better, diversity, you get to deal with educational people, environment, culture, language. So people leave their families regardless of paying a lot of money, that's okay, that's, that's, that's fine. So we, we're seeking for a better life and and ra now it's, it's affecting us by the president. Uh, so you have two very conflicting messages. One from exactly. our administration that's yeah. saying, you now you're a part of a travel ban. Mm -hmm. But then you also had the opportunity to see our community, right? Santa Barbara community show Sa up. Great support. And so support and be an ally. So uh, kind of I, I went a little bit down on that, on that issue and then it kind of gave me a lot of high motivation uh, f seeing the support from the community. And like next year, I'm earning the associate degree in kinesiology for transfer, and I want my parents to be with me to celebrate the graduation day, and to transfer to a four-year university to earn a athletic training bachelor's degree. But right now, I thought about it. I was like, there's no way that they can make it here. And I'm also grat grateful that also my brother, who's 23 years old, he t today he he turned 23, March 15th. Um, he's studying industrial engineering. He went to the U.S. Embassy uh, in Kuwait to apply for a student visa, and he was rejected three times, and I was accepted from the first time. So I should also be grateful and, and thankful for the opportunity and have to make the most out of it and take advantage of it. Yeah. yeah. So I, I want us to just take that moment to think about, again, that human side of this. Right, so we all hear about the travel ban. We know that it's affecting people, but here is one of our own Right, an SBCC student who can't have their parents or family here at graduation in a few in a few months. 
that's, I think it's so important for us to really have that, that human connection to this. Um, because otherwise it's just ideas and stories, right? But knowing that it's impacting our community. Um, and, and then from there, maybe that gives people the energy and the charge to go out and do more for those that maybe they don't know, right? Um, so thank you. Thank you, Ripal, for sharing. Um, uh, anyone else? Uh, experience of Islamophobia? Akil, I would love to hear just as someone who converted. Uh, I had a situation that was kind of, it was kind of, it wasn't funny, but um, I was at work and I was helping a student. This was actually yesterday. And um, so I had to walk him over to another department because he needed assistance from that department. So I go in and I'm talking to the, the employees um, in that uh, specific department. And, you know, you kind of make you know, small talk with your coworkers, right? Hey, what's going on? How you guys doing? And then, so we start talking about vacation, right? So I go, you guys taking vacation anytime soon? Because everyone's overworked, right? Everyone's like, I'm overworked. I'm like, well, you guys got vacation coming up? Um, and then one of them said, yeah. And then they asked me, do you have vacation coming up? And then, so, you know, I said, yeah, I'm trying to take some time in um, April. And so they're like, oh, that's great. Where are you going? And then I go, well, I'm trying to go to Saudi Arabia. And then all three of them, I, I think it was this, a subconscious thing. They didn't realize it. But all three of them were like, they, they, <laughs> they, all, they all jumped, right? And then you get the comments like, well, be careful. You know, and so that's that subconscious, like, Islamophobia where people don't think that they're doing anything wrong. Or, but in actuality, if I said, oh, I'm going to Hawaii, nobody would have jumped. Um, you know, they would be like, oh, great. I wish I could have gone with you. <laughs> but, you know, again, it's just that subtle things that people sometimes are un completely unaware of um, what they're saying or what their body language is actually doing. And uh, I just, I walked away and I was just like, man, I, I didn't, you know, I was, that was pretty interesting. And that's not the first time you've experienced that. Because you know, you've told me a few other times that similar when you talk about where you're going to go or yeah, um, what your plans are. Last year, I had a good fortune to to go to Africa, and I um, I was I went to West Africa um, to a country called Mauritania, and uh, it's right next to Morocco. Most people probably don't even know where that's at. They're like, "Where's that at?" Oh, it's, it's Africa. It's next to Morocco. It's next to Morocco. But yeah, a lot of people same thing. You know, like, why are you going there? And um, that's so far away from America. Be careful. <laughs> And to be honest with you, I, I went and I spent some time um, there and it was, it's just, it was amazing. It was really amazing, uh, the people, uh, the culture. Um, I think what, um, one takeaway I would say to everyone in the audience um, that they could take away and benefit themselves is I would say travel. You know, we don't, American people, we don't travel enough. Um, we get caught up in, in our nine to five, our ruts, we were taught, we're conditioned to graduate from high school, to go to a four year, to go to a two year, to go to a four year. Then you get the degree, then you apply for a job, then you get married, and then you buy the minivan, and then you get the house. Like, there's no time for, <laughs> I mean, there's no time for really to be able to just self reflect, you know? And, and, and again, so it's just one of those things where I feel that if we, we can somehow build a bridge by traveling, um, how many people have passports here? See this crowd? That's great. That's, That's why you're all here. <laughs> <laughs> but my point in all that is like we just need to see different. Like I was in, I was in West Africa in the middle of the desert, literally like no light. I felt safer there than like downtown LA, you know. <laughs> and. Uh, I mean, that's, that's the truth. I, w I never once not felt unsafe because I was American in a predominantly Muslim country. So I would say travel. Yeah. yeah. I may for a kill. Okay. He said, get married, get a minivan. Was that get a minivan, get married? <laughs> <laughs> I, I just drove though. my first minivan <laughs> a few weeks ago, and my husband and I were driving it, and he said, this is amazing. We need one. And I said, our kids are grown. I am not getting a minivan. <laughs> Everyone else who's not yet married, right? First you have one kid, two right. kids. They fight enough, then you get the minivan. Yeah, then you get the minivan. <laughs> So thank you. I'm going to open it up for you all to ask each other more questions, too, because I think that's sort of a nice dialogue to have. But I, I liked what you were saying, Akil, about um, 
those other people who did the jump when you asked, right? When, or when you told them uh, where you were going. And so this is sort of a big question, but take a moment to think about it. How do you think Islamophobia affects non-Muslims? And I don't mean by that people who can be perceived as Muslim or you know people from banned countries, but really just the average American person who's out there who has no connection to Islam. How does this homophobia impact them? If I may, um, I think all this negative stuff that's always on the media all the time has a huge effect on people. My wife and I, we had a flight uh, going from Vancouver to Toronto around September 14th or 17, 2001, after 9-11. And that's really a tough time to travel, but we had these flights booked and everything. Just watching everything I watched on the news and being impacted by all that, I got in an airplane and I saw a Middle Eastern person, another Muslim, I couldn't help but the thought ran in my head is, is he like me or is he like something else? Mm -hmm. That had an impact on me as a Muslim growing up. And I think we're lying if we don't admit that. Yeah. If you're seeing all this stuff on the media constantly, all this killing, all this negativity, and Middle Eastern people that they just keep showing pictures of that probably look like me or, or our brother Ribel over there, or maybe not so much him, but, you know, yeah. <laughs> I guess just me. <laughs> Akio, I he think there's can a just, lot of people who want to travel with Ribal here. The, you know, <laughs> Akio can just be Akio. I mean, other than his, you know. <laughs> but I have a beard and I stand out. And when I travel, last time the two U.S. immigration guards at my airplane, I just flew last month to West Africa. And as I was going, I was like, okay, I think I can get by. He said, hey, you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, <laughs> and he said, I said, me? Yeah, you, come here. Great. So let me see your passport. I have an American passport. I give it to him. He looks at me. He's like, where are you going? This and that. And I was expecting some more questions, but he just looked at me. He's like, all right, go ahead. And nobody else. He just looked at me. He said, come here. I've flown to where, you know, I've gone to the U.S. And I, at one time at my gate, as I was not even leaving the airplane, just as you leave, you know, we had three immigration officers. I don't know what kind of officers these were because they had guns with ammo on their shoulder. That's really rare. I haven't seen that. Three, four of them. And I thought to myself, there's somebody probably pretty dangerous on this flight. <laughs> and as I get out, they tell me, Mr. Niazi? I go, yes, come with us. I was like, wow. Yeah. Now I got escort straight from my gate, you know, three, four. We'll get your bags. Don't worry about it. Come with us. Seven, eight immigration officers. Where'd you go? What'd you do? A lady who was trained in Islamic sciences from al -Azhar. It's very interesting how far this has gone. But anyway, what was our question? Going back? <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the impact yeah, of that's Islamophobia the impact. is I on, mean, on non-Muslim people? Right. Yes. I think, you know, it kind of started on the <laughs> fear aspect. I think it's, 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 it's affecting them, I think, in the sense that I think they have some fear. And I think that they have been impacted and that's why I feel it's an obligation upon every single Muslim in this country to stand up to meet their neighbor and say hey I'm not here to hurt you I know that sounds really stupid but believe me there are people at this I've had people come to me at a church service after I gave a talk and I swear to God one lady came to me she said I wrote against your mosque and I was so fearful of you guys I am so sorry I didn't know and a guy came to me, he said, if other Muslims are like you, I'm okay with that. Right. But I didn't know. You know, that's the thing is people don't know. And Muslims haven't gone up to also just stand up and say, hey, this is who we are. I know it's tough times. I know it's scary out there. But I just want you to let you know that as a neighbor, you're welcome to come to my house, meet my kids, just kind of see who we are. So you're not afraid. You know, there's Muslims now, I think, their neighbor doesn't know who they are. You know, we have holidays that come up and Muslims don't really celebrate religious holidays and then they'll look like they stand out even more. Like, see, they don't even celebrate our Christmas. Right. They could be Jewish or something else and we don't celebrate. So there has to be this relationship building or the fear will just... And look at right now in the polls. I mean, half or more of Americans are fearful of Muslims because of everything they're watching. Hollywood movies, 
you know, news media, and most of the places where they fear Muslims, they've done studies is because they haven't met Muslims. Right. You know, and I've had people come to Friday prayer. I remember a group of parents came with their children. They look really disturbed, especially as the Friday call of to prayer was going on, Kate's class. And it's like, Allah, Akbar. and I can see their face like, oh, my God, it is. It is <laughs> this. And yeah. <laughs> after we finished, a lady said, did you go to San Marcos? I said, yes. She said, I think I went to school with you. I was like, yeah, this was great, and you should come talk to the parents. I'm like, talk to the parents, one, in Montecito, you want me to talk to all the parents of Montecito? <laughs> How do I get to go to people and talk to them? But it changed. Their faces went from really scared to not sure to afterwards just practically wanting to give us a hug, saying, how can I help? Right. How, what can I do? It's that human connection piece, yeah, and, and that allows us to kind of step back from the othering and the fear and the, the phobia. Right, because we, we get more familiar. Um, there was something else you said that stood out for me. Oh, that idea of how other people, so non-Muslims, also have a fear, right? Islamophobia, when we talk about that, is the, the fear of, um, of Islam and Muslims. So for you, your impact was, it makes me afraid. Right? And we talked about the psychological impact of that. So the same goes on the other end, right? That there's, there's so much trauma and emotional uh, investment in being afraid all the time. So Islamophobia is really impacting both sides of the coin very dramatically, right? I think what's really sad is that um, we're seeing the Sikh community as well being attacked because uh, people who are just paranoid are you know, oh, you wear a turban, so you must also follow that philosophy or that ideology. And, you know, we've seen so many Sikhs that have got shot and killed, and right. there was the, you know, the two Indian men that were killed also recently. I mean, it's affected other communities as well just because they look like us, right. you know, or because their skin is brown or because they're just different. Mm -hmm. And the people who don't understand, I mean, that's the extent of their, their knowledge. You know, that is the extent of their knowledge that, oh, because you look like somebody, so you must be that thing too. So, you know, there, it's, there's paranoia is like spreading like a disease, you know, and everyone is kind of like looking to their neighbors. And like, you know, Yama said, when Muslims see other Muslims that look too religious or too, you know, they're decked out in their turban and though on an airplane, you kind of think twice and it's, it's, you know, it's a struggle within because there's a lot of guilt that goes with that too for us Muslims, you know, because we're judging each other now. It's like we're turning against each other or something. And, you know, I mean, and there's well-wishing non-Muslims who would probably not be judgmental, but they become paranoid when they see certain things that they hear in the media. You know, we were at an event and everybody was singing America the Beautiful. And I was standing there uh, next to Yama and after the program, this woman came up to me and said, you, I was watching you, and you weren't singing. You weren't singing America the Beautiful. Why? And I was like, well, I'm Canadian. I don't know, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I don't know the words, <laughs> you know. So it's, it's just, it's, uh, it's a shame. <laughs> okay, did you have something, Akil? You know, um... <laughs> For me, it's interesting because I think people who convert to Islam, their family, when, you know, it's that whole process of, of, um, of telling your parents, hey, look, you know what, I'm, I changed faith, this is what I believe, this is what I'll be doing. Um, and so naturally, to, you know, your parents may have some type of phobia of not knowing what Islam is or what, what it's about. Um, I just remember when I converted and I, went, um, I was talking, I was having a conversation with my parents in regards to, uh, to to it, um, my mom kind of knew. Um, I mean, my mother was ex Black Panther in the '60s. I uh, lived up up in the Bay, so she kind of knew about Islam. And um, it's kind of oddly enough, a lot of African American people will, will give their kids Muslim names uh, just because um, out of what was going on in the '60s, right? So, for example, I mean, my father uh, his name's William. My grandfather's name was William. So then here comes a kill. Right. <laughs> and um, so my mother knew and, uh, uh, she, you know, she was like, hey, I'm a, you know, I was a Panther, ex Black Panther. I know, you know, um, and I thought it was kind of funny because she was like, yeah, you know, you know, T Tupac Shakur 
he's like, so everyone knows him. And, and my mom was like, is, he's, is he Muslim? And so, but my point is like the fear and the phobia is, is, is respected, I feel. I feel when someone doesn't know, they just don't know. And it's an opportunity for us to have that dialogue about this is what I'm going to be doing. Um, and, you know, uh, my father was Southern Baptist. And uh, he, it was for him, it was a little bit difficult, right? Because he grew up in the South um, a little bit. And then, um, but it's important to, to understand that it's okay, you know? Like, it's okay for people to have that because what, what else could we want for them? I mean, if they watch news all the time, they're automatically programmed, right? And so, it's, for me, it's like, okay, I understand that you're programmed, you know, almost a sense. But this is what we're, this is what Islam is about. This is, you know, this is, you know, I don't know. I, I guess the point in, in all of it is I feel actually bad for non-Muslims because I know from being black that they've, you know, there's somewhat, there's a programming going on, just how, like, how some people are, are scared of black people because they never met a black person, right? And then some people are scared of Muslims because they haven't met a Muslim. And so I kind of understand, I can kind of relate to that because I'm like, okay, I get it. You, you grew up here in America. You watch CNN all the time. And that's even a good, quote, good news network. I mean, if you're watching Fox, I don't even want to talk about <laughs> right, what that looks like, right? So, but again, I, I guess, you know, it's, 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 it's important for, for me to understand that people who don't know Muslims and have a phobia, it's okay, right? It's okay to, to, to be in that space because you've been almost somewhat pushed into that box uh, unless you've met another Muslim. It's just when you start acting out and you start assuming that everything is how it's supposed to be, that's when the problem comes. Um, but if it's just because you don't know, um, actions are by intentions, I feel. Um, and that's what I believe in. And so if, if you just don't know, you just don't know. Yeah. One of the statistics I saw was that um, six in ten Americans say they have never talked to a Muslim before. Six in ten. It's a lot. And so when I started sharing that around with some of my students today, they all started thinking. They were like, you know what? <laughs> I can remember the first Muslim I met. And how many of us can say, I remember the first boy I met, or I can remember the first, you know, um, Asian person I met. Most of us wouldn't remember those things, but a lot of people can go back and go, I remember that one Muslim that I met way back in, you know, fifth grade. So that's, that's an unfortunate piece, I think, and, and that goes back to what you were saying about it. It's sort of um, on the onus of both sides, right? That for the Muslim community going out and, and making that effort, and then also for the rest of us to show up at panels like this, to, ha to take those opportunities to meet people. When I first met um, Imam Yama, I was at that, that rally that, um, that Reba was talking about, and I remember you said, anybody who wants me to speak and talk and share. And I was like, right here. <laughs> so I jumped on that one, you know. And um, I think that it's, it's a really important thing to do right again and from that really human, human perspective. I, I wanted to add one thing about yeah. this six out of ten. I think that figure is probably not true uh, or is maybe has a flaw for one reason that most Muslims, again, may not look like me Right. And even me, just before the program, somebody asked me if I was Arab. I said no. So he started speaking to me in Spanish right away. <laughs> and, um, you know, because yes, maybe I could look like I'm Mexican. That's true. And I think, apart from the hat, because I'm speaking at an event and my haircut's not so great. And then the <laughs> second, because, you know, what does a Muslim look like? Right. You know, what I tell people is no, you definitely met a Muslim. You've spoken to a Muslim or you heard a Muslim, know. you just didn't know. I mean, uh, you know, our president, Barack Hussein, you know. It's <laughs> <laughs> just a joke, lighten it up. It's just a joke. It's my, you know. So, we are um, live streaming. Watch you know, out. No. There's a, uh, it's my joke I always use in classrooms. I say, you just didn't know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is, like I grew up with basketball. You know, I loved basketball. And there were basketball players you didn't know that were Muslim. Um, uh, in fact, a Utah jazz player came to our mosque. We prayed. The guy said, do you know he's a jazz player? I said, no, Ennis Cantor. Um, pe some people may not know him, but you know, what does a Muslim look like? They right. don't always look like what you think. You know, Come to our Friday prayer, you'll see there's a diverse group. Of course, if sisters wear hijab, and some don't. 
uh, and that's fine. But y- they will not always look like whatever people want a Muslim to look like, you yeah. know. And that's a really p- important thing, I think, because again, what the media gives us is this one singular narrative, right? This is what it looks like. One of my favorite um, actor comedians is Maj Jobrani. He's a um, an Iranian uh, comedian and actor, and he was talking recently about uh, in the beginning he would always get roles to play a terrorist, right? It, it was it was just a terrorist, and he would show up, and one of the one of the event or roles that he had. They said, okay, you're this guy from Afghanistan, blah, blah, blah. And they gave him all this clothes from a completely different region. And he goes, well, wait, you know, I'm Persian, but I know that Afghani people don't wear this. So let me, he, and he said, I wanted to take this noble high road. Like, I'm going to educate, you know, this the film crew. And they were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Yeah, okay, come back tomorrow. And he said, and I had the same outfit that I had told them the day before. And he said, that was the last role I ever played of a terrorist, right? Because again, he realized I'm just propagating this myth, this story and this narrative. And so I, I'm totally with you. I think that we, you know, how many people introduce themselves right off the bat? Hi, my name is so-and-so. I'm a, I'm a Muslim. Probably not, right? So we may have more encounters than we know. Um, but that's, that's an interesting thing to think about. So we have questions from the audience. I'm going to gather those. Um, but I also wanted to see, do you all have any questions for each other? Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Give it to the audience. OK. So we have a lot of questions. We won't be able to get to all of them, but um, I think that we had talked about afterwards, saving some time for outside if people have questions that they would like to to ask. Um, So when we wrap up this event, then we'll be able to have that opportunity for some one-on-one discussion outside as well. Um, Okay, let me see. Oh, I have a really sweet question. The young man from Syria, when will you graduate and may we attend? So they're asking, when is your graduation? <laughs> and, and can they be there for you? <laughs> so not this May, next year, because I have to get some work experience in the athletic training room here at City College. I have to earn some uh, certain hours, up to 50 hours. And uh, so hopefully, yeah, next year, I'm looking forward for that. And I do really appreciate the fact that you're interested. (laughs) (laughs) You might have a very large cheering section. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. Thank you. So many great questions here. So the next one I'm going to ask is, why do women wear hijab, the women who choose to? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's a religious question yeah, it's for the imam <laughs> um, it's you know in Islam we have the concept of modesty and each religion has this concept I think if you look back at the pictures of uh, you know what we think is Mary um, she, she's wearing the uh, hijab and it's, it's really a, it's a modesty, it's a gesture of modesty, and that's, uh, for me, it's what I wear it is I feel that when I'm wearing my hijab, I'm, I'm in constant worship of God. It's a constant reminder of God's presence in my life, and that how he would want me to present myself. Um, so, I mean, that's what it is. I mean, each woman may have their own personal reason, you know. Somebody may do it for cultural reasons, others may do it for religious reasons. Uh, I grew up not wearing the hijab, S- and I used to actually, at, at my high school, there was a couple of girls that wore hijab, and every time I see them walking toward me in the hall, I turn around and walk <laughs> the other way. Yeah. I was afraid. I was like, and I w- when I met Yama, I said, hey, I know you're getting into religion, but I'm never going to wear the hijab. It's just not something that I'm going to do. And he's just like, okay, that's your, you know, your thing. It's, it's how, it's, it's that, for me, it's that personal relationship that I've made and built with God. So, and this is how I, I, I present that relationship. That's really beautiful. Thank you. How about um, Hibar Arsali? Would you like to talk about that too? Um, 
like she said, it's a personal decision. Everyone has their own reason to wear it. But I feel like, um, for me, it's like a constant reminder that I'm doing this for God. Everything that I'm doing, I'm doing it for God and for no one else. And for people to know that, like, to for the guys, to keep your distance, just like, <laughs> <laughs> I am here uh, to please God. Um, and that's my only purpose. And for myself, as a reminder, that if I go to school, I'm gonna go to prayer before like anything else. Right. If I'm at home, I don't know, maybe take it up. I'm gonna wake up, because I gotta pray. It's just like a constant reminder to myself. Yeah, so like everyone said, it is a constant reminder for me as well. I didn't grow up wearing the hijab either, but I chose to wear it because I wanted that connect, closer connection to God and also reminding myself like the strength that like I have and how how I can carry on in the like, pervasive, like, pervasive like, political climate right now. Um, it helps me f remind myself of, like what my teachings are and what my um, what my faith means to me. So that's why I wear it. Thank you. Um, I have a question that, that's about three questions mixed together. And it's, a, I think, a bigger question than we might be able to handle. But I'm going to put it out there. And um, if you can touch on it, and then if it's something that you can follow up on later, it would be great. So this person asks about, um, you know, you, you talked about infidels, where we hear about that a lot. Now I'm talking to you. <laughs> um, and so this person says, are Christians considered infidels or unbelievers? Um, how does true Islam feel about Christians? So I guess we're look, making that distinction between Islam and Mislam, right? Um, and if it's not Christians, then who who are the infidels that we're talking about? What are the infidels that we're speaking of? <laughs> Let me look up in my dictionary exactly <laughs> what infidel is. I think it's a it's a very negative connotation to disbelief. And I think that as I read the Quran, I understand it as that there are those who accept the message of the Prophet Muhammad. And essentially his message is that there is one God. And that's where Judaism and Christianity agree that we all look to Abraham as the founding father of the monotheistic religions. And Islam acknowledges that Judaism and Christianity and their prophets and their original books given to them were given by God. So you actually cannot be a Muslim if you don't believe in Moses and if you don't believe that God directly spoke to him and that he used them to deliver the children of Israel from Pharaoh. It's all in the Quran. Mm -hmm. you, as an article of faith, you have to believe in that. As Muslims, we're also, you cannot be a Muslim if you don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah born miraculously to the best women of all times. That is Mary. The Quran calls Mary the best woman chosen of all time. Right? So... It's an article of faith for Muslims to believe in Jesus. Yes, as a Muslim, I say, when I hear Jesus loves you, I say, I hope so. Mm -hmm. Because I love Jesus. And I love Mary as well. And that's, I think, uh, I know Akil, coming from a Christian background, I'm sure for people that convert in who are Christian, they don't lose uh, the identity of Christ. They love still Christ, and they have that relationship. In fact, the Prophet Muhammad, he says that those who convert to Islam from Christianity or Judaism, we'll get two rewards. The reward of believing in the prophet of that time that had come, and also the belief that Muhammad is the last and chosen one. As a category, I think as I understand it, that those who practice the religion of Islam, who call themselves Muslim, essentially by doctrine means they believe in the Holy Quran, mm -hmm. that is the word of God, and the final revelation out of, you can say the Old Testament, the New Testament, we would like to argue the final testament right. so that there's this continuation just like as a muslim we would say that you know as a as as jewish uh followers of of moses they had to believe in jesus as well that that all goes in a package so i would say that what islam teaches is that you must acknowledge all of the prophets and when you do that you are a complete believer in what god sent down to the prophet muhammad but as a category where we would say this person's in trouble in the next life, etc., we would leave that to God because there's variables in a person's life, what they're exposed to, what they've learned, and on all those other things. So that's not for us to judge. Um, and, and again, 
the Jews and the Christians in particular are called Ahlul Kitab, people of who were given the book before. Um, I myself eat kosher because I'm allowed to by my religion because uh, Jewish uh, folks and also Christian, uh, we can eat and marry in uh, with that faith if you're getting married uh, for men. And so this is something that we, we celebrate. But at the same time, uh, others who follow other paths, other faiths, you know, we respect all faiths. Mm -hmm. In the Quran it says, La ikraha fi deen. There's no compulsion in religion. Everyone will follow. We respect that. But this is what our religion teaches. So would you say that maybe this idea of the infidel is another one of those bits of propaganda or of, of Islam that we, because we hear it so much in media, right? We hear it so much in movies. Like it's something that they love to just throw that out and then it, then we know that, that, you know, that's a terrorist or an extremist. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it is because, you know, what they want to say from it is that this person becomes okay to attack or to condemn or things like that. And I think that's unfair because as a Muslim, our Prophet taught us, treat all of humanity. He doesn't say Muslim, he doesn't say Jew, Christian, none of that. He says, Khaliq al nasi bi khuliq al hasan. Deal with humanity, with humankind, and the best way of how you transact, how you live with them. Um, even if they're righteous or not, believer in God or not, you have to deal with people in a very beautiful way, with excellence helping them out, being courteous, being good to them. And part of it is not to condemn them by saying hurtful words to them. Um, but, you know, at the same time acknowledging that uh, our religion calls to a certain type of belief. If you don't want to accept it, that's fine. That's a person's decision. But to go to that far, I think what it, uh, my understanding of it is that it often is connotated with violence, with, with uh, condemnation of hellfire to people like that. And I think that that's not a good way of looking at it. I think that that's not accurate. And I think that uh, the Prophet warns us also not to label anybody with where they're going in the hereafter, uh, whether they're unrighteous or whatever faith, because no one knows the future but God, and no one can judge in reality other than God. Right. It's not for m us mortals to decide. No, right. it's not. Okay. Um, let's see what else we have here. I think I'm going to do two more questions, and then we'll have a few um, to save outside. Um, this is an interesting one, and I, it, I hope that others can also uh, talk about this answer in addition to um, Imam Yama. But how do we reconcile progressive val values um, like gay rights and traditional Islamic values in the Quran? So how can you have both of those things, or can you have both of those things? So they're talking about progressive values such as um, gay rights and the Quran. Can those things go hand in hand? And I know in some of the research I was doing, um, talking about there, you might find some groups that are much more progressive and you'll find some that are, are a little less so. So is, is there room for, I guess, progressive values and rights in, in Islam and in the Quran? I think, again, on a level of how we interact with one another, I think that you know, gays should have every right that everyone else has, my personal opinion, and how we deal with them and how we transact with them and how we are to, um, you know, the things I mentioned earlier, being a good neighbor, helping them, assisting them and all of that. Um, and I think that those things are an obligation in the religion. And at the same time, God is the one who's going to judge. If you were to ask me that, does Islam from a Quranic perspective say that that is an accepted lifestyle or something that goes within it, I think that you'll find the overwhelming majority of Muslims to say that no, it does not. And the reason why is because the story of Adam and Eve is clear uh, in that um, the type of lifestyle that the Prophet Muhammad lived and what he taught us, we would say that the ideal is for men and women to be together, and that's from the religious perspective. However, how we deal and respect one another, I think, is equal. You know, we should not discriminate against anybody based on their religion, nor their personal practice, particularly here in the United States, because we're all one people trying to live together, trying to work out things together. For me to judge another, then where, at which point, do we stop with one another in every religion, almost? You know, there's always going to be criticism. Um, and I don't want to speak for other religions, but we all have some type of stereotype or some type of judgment that we will give as a belief. 
you know, and I think Muslims are not alone in that, and other faiths also hold these views. However, where I separate myself from others is I don't call to violence, and I don't say that they should be treated any way different than how others are treated. And I think most of the time you'll find that gay people are much nicer than, uh, uh, you know, just in their, how they are, because I think they feel they're very discriminated against. They feel they have to stand up for themselves, and they tend to be a lot nicer, in my experience, than other people. So I appreciate that, and I like to uh, transact on that type of level. But when I'm asked, does Islam allow this, or is this a path that is taught in the Quran? I have to say no, right. on my understanding, no. So what I hear, though, too, is that you're able to know that and have that as part of your faith, yeah. but also the way you live is in, you know, sort of like you were saying, it almost reminds me of the golden rule in Christianity, right? Do unto others. And so you, you love thy neighbor, that sort, of, that sort of idea, right? And so you can have your faith and what those beliefs are within it, but also live um, as um, someone who promotes equity and diversity and, and peace. Yes, because I think in the end, what we have to understand is how we live our life and our experience on life is what's going to matter in the end of the day. It's how somebody smiles at you and how somebody doesn't look to harm you or discriminate against you. If they believe a certain thing of what they feel will happen in the next life, that's their personal belief. And I think that this country is built on respecting that belief. And I think where we all agree is when we start getting violent towards one group or another, when we start to harm one group or another uh, over another. And I think that is when it is really uh, not within the teachings of our religion and also what really makes this country because one of the purpose, the main purpose of Islamic law is uh, a type of uh, having peace and safety amongst people. That once you get into violence and bloodshed, that this destroys all other, uh, uh, trying to put out other goals to achieve. That is where we want to avoid that harm at all costs. I'm just looking at the time. I'm going to do, do, yeah, of course. Uh, one of my housemates, uh, he has different social orientation. He's, he's obviously gay, uh, but I do not look at him in different perspective. He's respectful. He's a very hardworking student. He's got two jobs. He goes to school, and he invites his boyfriend once every week, and I do respect him. I mean, why why would you know why wouldn't I respect him because he's ha or he has different ori orientation, sexual orientation. Um, so, personal opinion, yeah, we're sh everyone should be uh, has an open mind yeah. to this kind of things. Thank you. So, my final question for you all was to ask, um, what can we do in our community? at SBCC to um, challenge this Islamophobia, to create safer spaces for our um, Muslim brothers and sisters on campus. So what are some, some ideas that you have? And I know I, I've seen so many other campuses are doing panels like this, having discussion spaces, having safe spaces. But if, if there were things on this campus that you could see as being um, helpful, what, what might some of those things be? I think we should continue the, the food program, <laughs> um, <laughs> right? Luis, that's you. Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm serious because our, our prophet teaches us a beautiful statement when he walks into Medina. He sees a mixed community of Jewish uh, followers and other faiths, and he sees a diverse group. And uh, the head rabbi of that time, he relates in a story because it's his first expression or first experience when he meets the prophet. He says, let me go hear what he has to say. It's his first looking fresh at him in Medina. And he comes, he says, Ya Yuhannas, O humanity, O people, spread peace mm. and feed others. And I'm going to leave the second of the two things he said uh, later because, you know, it's pray in the night when others are asleep and connect kinship bonds. That's something you can kind of do. But the first part of spread peace and feed people I always used to really think there were two separate things, but I'm starting to really realize there's a deeper wisdom in that. Absolutely. Spread peace while feeding people. Yeah. <laughs> because who is going to honestly hate you or dislike you when they're like, 
You want to try the shawarma? Yeah. Uh, you know, this is an Afghani eggplant dish. I don't know why I didn't like you. You're right. all right. <laughs> and I think traditional cultures, how many times do you hear stories when you travel to another country? I know people who went to Afghanistan in the 70s, besides a lot that smoked a lot of hashish that was there. <laughs> um, you know, they have this relationship where they say the hospitality was right. incredible. But look at their experience when they came back. They say, we love Afghan people. They're really cool. They're really nice. Because of that experience. When you feed people, it's not just feeding them. It's showing your love for them. It's showing your compassion for them. And it brings hearts together as opposed to just talk, 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 but actually sharing and knowing that they took time out to want to sit with you. Right. That's an expression of peace, love, and all the right things that go together. I would say that is a good starting point so you can yeah. tell us when it's the next so program true. will be. And I think I mentioned to you before um, when we were broke bread and we were all talking about some of these issues that there was actually a study done recently that said if you want people to join you, eat with them. And not just eat with them, but eat of the same dish. So eat the same food. Because when you do that, you build that connection from that very primal level, right? So it is really true. So we're doing a good job, Luis. <laughs> because, and Luis always says, too, he comes from Homeboy Industries, and he talks about breaking bread with one another and how important and fundamental that is to, to us communing and joining one another and learning and spreading peace. So I agree. We'll feed more. <laughs> Thank you. And I think we have, as Muslims, we have about a maximum 10 minutes. We have to get a prayer in. Okay. So, um, so uh, I think one last, I think that Araceli had her hand up. So yeah. we'll do that, and then we will. Uh, I just wanted to say uh, we can always spread awareness uh, to the non-Muslims here. Don't be scared to come up to us and ask us questions out of some Facebook. We can talk on Facebook. We can, like, meet up at Yogurt Land. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but, yeah, um, we can start like a conversation, so we, so you can meet a Muslim. You don't have to be afraid, and yeah, like we can all be friends. <laughs> Wonderful. <Thank you. laughs> so if we could plan to have a time where we could get together and maybe have like a time to join and have some lunch and meet, would you be open to that? Yeah, of course. Wonderful. Thank I'm you. Sure one last appeal. <laughs> Real quick, one last thing. I think it would be great, um, hopefully, once this new building, or I think it's right over here, gets constructed, if we could just have some type of place where people could come and congregate, um, have like a safe space for people to pray, um, um, so that way people aren't feeling isolated, um, praying out by themselves. Um, or um, I work in admissions. Uh, you can always swing by. We can always like maybe pray together, um, that kind of thing. But I think there'd be it'd be nice to see the college um, create a safe space for where people can, and not only Muslims obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, just a safe place where people can come and congregate and feel uh, that th th this is a peaceful place. Um, and I think that w that would help that way as well. Okay. Well, thank you all so very much for being on the panel tonight and enlightening us. <laughs> And we will let you know when we get that, um, we call them brown bag lunches, where we all sit together and join. So we'll, we'll send that out to the campus. Smiling. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>